something similar to what Aubrey did yesterday in relation to life extension, where he made a case of how it is actually feasible for us to achieve significant life extension and perhaps indefinite life extension. And I'm planning, hoping to do the same for uh, building human level artificial intelligence. So the, the first thing is what is intelligence and there's a whole lot of cloud of philosophical issues around humanity and intelligence and so forth, consciousness, qualia, free will, etc. I'm going to put those issues aside. I'm going to take a kind of instrumental view of what is artificial intelligence. In other words, if something behaves intelligently, then it is intelligent. So it's really kind of like a, a Turing test, if you will. Can we build machines that, if, that can do the things that humans do, that are flexible, uh, capable, that can deal with complicated situations and so forth? Now, one of, the, one of the definitions of artificial intelligence is the things that computers can't do yet. So there's been this sort of sliding bar. A lot of the things that we see now that happen on a routine basis, such as language translation in Google, would have been regarded as artificial intelligence a long time ago. But now we just kind of accept them as part of the norm. So it, it, is, a, it is a moving scale. However, it's fair to say, I think, that human level intelligence has not been achieved. And if you look at the slide, the top part of the slide, some of you will recognise the HAL 9000 from 2001, A Space Odyssey. And HAL was to have been a super intelligent computer that, that had surpassed human intelligence, although HAL had some, some issues. <laughs> Uh, so we, we didn't get there and part of what I'm going to answer is why that hasn't happened and why we should still think that it may happen in the future. Uh, what of course we got was, you know, blue, around that time was Bill Gates and the blue screen of death. Now, okay so my talk's in three parts. The first part is dealing with hardware. What sort of processing capacity do computers need to have to achieve human level intelligence? And secondly, the question of the software and the algorithms, if you will, what, how are we going to program these things? A lot of people say, look, even if we have a vast amount of computing resources, we don't know how the brain works. We don't know how we're going to program these things. The programmers aren't available. They're all building social networking sites or what have you. So how are we going to program these computers? And the third part is I'm going to show some demonstrations of where we are with artificial intelligence and videos. Okay, so my prediction is that by 2020 to 2040 we will have human level intelligence. So that's just to set the scene. Okay, first hardware. Now the question is, how powerful is the human brain? And you can do a rough back of the envelope calculation. You don't need to go through all the, all the numbers there. But basically, the, the, the bottom line is the human brain is incredibly powerful. It can do 10 quintillion operations per second. And that, that far surpasses the capacity of your uh, desktop <laughs> computer. And in your desktop computer, most of the processing power is actually in the uh, graphics unit, interestingly enough. But even, even with that, it, it, uh, uh, the human brain outpaces your desktop computer by a factor of perhaps 2,000. So there is a big gap between what the brain can do now and what a computer can do now. And if you look back in history, uh, the, uh, you can see the, the little P up there. That roughly represents the, what the desktop computer can do if it was, or what it would look like if it was scaled to the human brain's size. The tiny dot below that for 2002 is what we had in 2002. And the almost invisible dot below that is what we had in 1992. So historically we have had absolutely minuscule amounts of processing power at our disposal to, in, to try and uh, generate human level intelligence. So that I think is part, a big part of the answer of why haven't we built human level intelligence yet. It's simply that the hardware hasn't been available yet. Okay, so let's have a look at the progress of, of hardware over the years. Now on the left there you see two graphs which are on a log linear scale. So a straight line represents exponential growth. That is to say, computers roughly get five, uh, 10 times more powerful every five years. And you can see on the top one, barely, that 
This increase in processing power goes back to mechanical calculators in the 1890s. So right from that time through to electromechanical calculators, vacuum tubes, transistors, it's integrated circuits, etc., etc. We've had this actually slightly increasing pace of growth in the power of computers for 120 years. So this has been a trend which has continued for a long time. The bottom graph just shows, fills out some of the more recent years and shows that this trend has continued recently. Okay. Now, every so often, I, as long as I can remember having I've got into computers, I uh, wrote my first program in 1974, even at that time people were predicting that Moore's Law was not going to last much longer, and there was an article a couple of days ago saying exactly the same thing, but I don't see any signs of this increase, this exponential increase in processing power diminishing any time soon. What we need is another 20 to 25 years, on top of the 120 years we've already had, and we're going to get to human level hardware capability. Now, down the uh, bottom right hand side of the slide, you can see one interesting aspect of exponential growth. If something grows at a constant fraction each year, it doesn't look like even growth. What it looks like is nothing much happens and then suddenly, bang. This uh, graph here is a graph of websites on the internet in the late uh, 1990s. And you see that it appears as nothing happens, it appears there was a knee in the curve, and then suddenly you went from 1 million to 30 million websites over a short period of time. This is what exponential growth looks like. The internet was nowhere, I beg your pardon, the internet was nowhere and then suddenly it's everywhere. What I'm suggesting is that the same thing is going to happen with hardware capacities as well. Hardware capacities are minuscule compared to the human brain, and then at some point this exponential growth will take it from minuscule compared to the human brain to parity to far beyond the human brain. That's what exponential growth looks like as long as it continues. So just to reinforce the point about Moore's Law not dying, let's look at some recent hardware developments. We've had the first uh, quantum computer sold commercially recently. Uh, we've had the you know, more powerful graphics processes coming out uh, over the last 12 months. We've had a single atom transistor, that is to say a, a transistor which is a basic physical unit out of which computers are made. A, a transistor constructed out of a single atom, which is an amazing achievement. Uh, we had a breakthrough recently where certain kinds of algorithms can be uh, executed 10 to the 80 times faster than previously. And uh, the, my favourite one is the one at the top right there, which is that in Japan recently they have actually rolled out a computer which has parity with the human brain in physical processing capacity. Now this thing occupies a space about four times as big as this room, and it consumes something like 40 megawatts. Just the power alone is a quarter of a million dollars an hour. So it's not cost effective to use this to replace a human worker at this point. But it does, it does represent a proof of concept that says we can build a computer that has as much processing power as the human brain. What we're dealing with now is an issue of power consumption, heat and uh, cost feasibility. So in summary, I see Moore's Law continuing and if you extrapolate it out, somewhere, somewhere between 20 to 25 years out, we will have physical parity with the human brain. Now, that's great, you've got a computer, and as we all know, a computer without software is useless. It can do nothing. So what, what progress is being made on the question of how do we build the software to build these, computer, uh, build these systems that are going to be uh, as smart as humans? And how are we going to program them? So this slide talks about the progress in artificial intelligence. And you can see over the left hand side, during the 1980s, well actually I'll go to this uh, hype graph which is at the top right. This was invented by Harvard and popularised by the Gartner Group. This is the sort of hype cycle of any new technology. And what you see is a new technology comes along. This applied to, for example, ballpoint pens. Everyone gets very excited, it's wonderful. And then the problems come out of the woodwork. It's unreliable. It, it, it poured ink all over my uh, uh, 
my marriage certificate, etc., etc., and you, then you get this trough of disillusionment, yeah. and there's a backlash. With artificial intelligence, this happened in the 1980s. Then what you see is a period of gradual retrenchment where, where people actually work on the thing and get the bugs out, fix it, work around it, work out how to use it, etc., and eventually you reach the trough the plateau of productivity. So that's the sort of normal hype cycle for any new technology, any radically new technology in particular. And the list at the left is a list of the, the significant breakthroughs that have occurred in artificial intelligence software since that AI winter in the 1980s when it went through the trough of disillusionment. And I'll be talking in detail about some of these later on. But uh, as, I, as Adam mentioned, uh, two years ago, when I, after I went to the first Singularity Summit, I actually quit my job and retired because I wanted to use some of this artificial intelligence stuff. And I'm now faced with the fact that there is more artificial intelligence algorithms and techniques out there than I can actually use, for example, in my futures trading. It's almost like an embarrassment of riches. Okay, so I'm, I've picked out three of these techniques to, for a bit of more of a deep dive. And the first one is reinforcement learning. And one of the problems with programming computers is that it is a very, as any one of you who've done it knows, it's a very tedious and slow progress, a slow process. For example, in the uh, typical Australian bank would have, say, something like 100 million lines of software. And it costs about 10 to 20, 10 to 50 dollars to produce a fully debugged line of code in a system. That, and that sounds like a lot if you've ever written a small program, but when you're building large complex systems, that's a realistic figure. They have a phenomenal investment and programming is very expensive. So how do you sort of get around this problem? And one of the videos I'll show you later is of uh, a helicopter which Andrew Ng, some software to drive a model helicopter which Andrew Ng developed, which uses this technique called reinforcement learning. And the idea is you give the computer a generalised learning system and then you basically tell it, when it behaves, you tell it what you like and what you don't like. And the computer then uses that generalised learning algorithm to learn how to do things. And there's a, there's a lot of science of this going back several decades. And what Andrew Ng found was that in spite of the fact that there had been numerous attempts in the past to kind of program by hand software to fly model helicopters, he was able to do it using this reinforcement learning very quickly by letting the computer learn itself how to, how to fly the helicopter. And the video is amazing. He's got the helicopter flying upside down and doing zigzags and spirals and all sorts of things at the very limits of what humans can do. And bear in mind, this is with the equivalent of a brain the size of a pea. So reinforcement is a big key here because reinforcement learning allows the computer to learn for itself. And we don't have to hand code everything that the computer does. Instead, we, we set it up with a general learning algorithm and, and tell it what we don't do and don't like. Okay, the second technique is support vector machines. This is a very technical, uh, technical thing, so I won't go into all the details, but basically you can more or less throw any sort of data at a support vector machine and it will kind of make sense of it. It uh, mathematically, you throw the data in, you give it what's called a kernel function, which measures how far it, the points are apart. You convert that uh, space of points into a dual space. You then apply uh, what's known as a quadratic optim optimization algorithm in that dual space. That gives you the answer, then you convert it back to the original space, and then you've got your answer. And one good thing about support vector machines is that it automatically deals with one of the very thorny issues with artificial intelligence and data mining generally, which is overfitting. I don't know if any of you have ever done any uh, uh, technical trading with uh, investments and so on, but one of the big problems is you, can, you do a back testing on a strategy and you set your parameters up, you're moving averages and da da da, and it works really well and makes you millions of dollars on past data. So, you open a brokerage account and start investing, and lo and behold, you don't make any money. In fact, you lose money. This is because with the past data, you've overfitted 
uh, onto the past data and you haven't really developed a robust set of, of uh, parameters that will work into the future. And support vector machines through something that's pretty close to magic actually deals with this issue of overfitting because it always seems, it always finds something very close to the most simplest solution that actually solves the problem. So support vector machines came out in the 19, uh, the first paper was about 1992, uh, but they've really come out into their own uh, since 2000 as hardware's become more powerful because it needs quite a lot of memory. Okay, this third one is probably the most exciting algorithm in my opinion, and hierarchical temporal memory, and there's some other variants called uh, Destin and Deep Learning, and it's modelled on how the cerebral cortex, the neocortex, which is our thinking brain, and how it works. And effectively, uh, the system is divided up into cells in layers, and at each layer, the, the cells look for patterns in the input that they're getting. Not only patterns uh, of dots or whatever, as you, as you might think, but also patterns in time as well. This is where the temporal side comes into it. So the, at each level you're looking for patterns in time, something that happens, like for example a, a slanted line that might be moving across the visual field. Then the layer above that looks for patterns of those patterns, and so on and so on. And what you get is you get little lines, you get an eye, you get something, 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 and eventually you end up with a dog. So, uh, and I'll show you a video of this later, where it, uh, it uh, picks out people from a visual field. So again, this is another algorithm where you don't actually really have to train it or to program it. It learns to recognise different things and you just come in at the top and say, that thing you've recognised, that's what we call a car or whatever, and from then on it will remember that that's a car or that's a human or whatever. So. Uh, one of the good things about hierarchical temporal memory is that it seems to be related to how the, how the human brain actually works. So, even though in detail we don't understand how the brain works, we've been able to sort of glean this, this uh, algorithm out and then we can apply it very efficiently with hardware. The, the picture at the bottom right there is just a, a picture of some of the uh, neurons in the, in the human brain. Okay, so I've left plenty of time for these applications and demonstrations. I think the, just like to make one point, and that is that we're having progress, significant progress in hardware, as I said, 10 times more processing power every five years, and we're having significant progress in software as well. What happens is when you combine those two, you get one and one equals four, and I'll, I'll explain how. If you take, say, support vector machines, they were invented in the 1990s, but they're not really usable until the 2000s because the hardware wasn't available. So what we're finding is computers become more powerful. We can pull out a lot of these algorithms out of the bag of tricks that were invented years ago, and suddenly they become useful. Similarly, often you'll have algorithms such as support vector machines which are much more efficient than, the, you know, say, the old neural networks uh, backpropagation software that takes better use of existing hardware. So in that way, hardware and software advances synergize, work together, and you get, as I said, one and one equals four. And this, this syndrome of software being developed or algorithms being developed, and it's only very much later that you can actually use them, is quite a common thing in the computer field. So, for example, graphical user interfaces, were first mooted in about 1963. Uh, the Xerox Park experiment was in 1981 and really went mainstream. Well, apologies to the uh, Apple bigots here, but really went mainstream with Windows 3.1 in 1992. So there's, there's a big lag there. High level programming languages were invented in the 50s, really came into, into uh, frequent use in the 1980s. The uh, forward, fourth generation scripting languages such as Python, were invented in the 80s and early 80s and really came into their own in the late 90s or 2000s. Uh, languages like Java, the concepts were around in the 50s but only came into common use in the late 90s. Object-oriented programming was invented in the 50s and came into common use in the, in the 90s. Uh, and probably the 
most amazing example is the general purpose computer, the Babbage's analytical engine, was invented in 1857, but the first actual physical working general purpose computer in hardware was about 1943, 1944. So it's very typical to have software developed and the algorithms ready, waiting for the hardware to become available that can exploit it. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the, the DARPA Desert Challenge, which is a self-driving car which got itself through the desert and won uh, Stanford on the prize. This was sponsored by the Defence uh, Research Organisation, DARPA, in the US. I showed this video four years before. The, the this is a couple of hundred miles, I think. Four years before, no, no, none of the contestants got even ten percent of the way. That's right, I'll, I'll talk to it. So this, this is the vehicle, you can see at the top it's got various laser range finders, etc. And this actual trial it turned into actually a speed race because there were actually two cars that were very close together and uh, so it came down to speed. Now what he's doing here is he's showing that with the laser range finders he can see the road but only one or two car lengths ahead. So it's not enough forward visibility to, to, to go fast because, you know, obviously if you're going to see two or three car lengths ahead, you have to be able to stop in that distance and that constrains your speed. So what they did was they melded that with the visual system and said, well, look, the laser says this part of the surface is, is flat and it's road, so what we'll do is anything that looks like that we'll assume is road. And you can see here, He's taking a square, square there where he's working out what, what, what road looks like and now he knows what the road is way ahead. So this enabled him to go at, at quite high speeds and uh, win the challenge. Any cars coming the other way? Uh, well, we'll get to the Google car which is going driving around San Francisco where you'll see that in, uh, in spades. But, so this was out in the desert. so. Uh, and uh, you know there is this kind of bloopers uh, video of the ones that didn't go so well, <laughs> where, where they did all sorts of silly things. Right. Uh, for some reason, it didn't show there. There's track of it showing the video of it going. Going through, uh, sorry, there's video of it going through, going down winding mountain tracks and all sorts of things as well. Okay, now I'll show you the uh, Google car, which is actually a similar concept, but it's driving around San Francisco. And they now actually have a blind guy who it, it chauffeurs around the city. Okay, here we are in the Google car. It's, as you can see, it's driving itself and no hands. And this is obviously a much bigger challenge than driving through the desert because you've got other cars, you've got people. You've just, uh, Sebastian threw in there, who was the uh, inventor of it, pointing out the laser range finder. We've got a very nervous reporter getting in the back seat there. Okay, 
and you can see some sort of representations of how the software calculates things and works stuff out, uh, working, work, working out where cars are, etc. So the, the, the beauty of it is that, that uh, you don't have to drive the car, so you can do something else while the car is driving itself, and it, inherently it's, it, it never gets drunk and so forth and so on. Okay. Here's a shot of it uh, just stopping at a stop sign and waiting for uh, cyclists to go past. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, it, it, uh, you know, this is out live in the actual real San Francisco traffic, so it, it has to deal with all those contingencies. One thing it can't deal with is snow, because there's not, not enough contrast on the surface to, to work out where the road is. Okay, the next one's this self-flying self helicopter, and just bear in mind, no one actually coded this software, and the fact that it's flying upside down and all that sort of thing is actually deliberate, it's not out of control. That's Andrew Young, who uh, is the guy who developed this. Okay, so the helicopter's about to be displayed all the way. So flying a helicopter is very hard. It's a lot harder than flying a fixed-wing aircraft. So it does all sorts of things. Back, uh, flies upside down. It does this sort of manoeuvre where, where it sort of goes around in a circle. All sorts of things that, that people have, have a great deal of trouble doing. And as I said, it's all been done without explicitly programming how to fly a helicopter. The thing won't for itself simply by feedback about what's good and what's bad, such as crashes are bad and staying in the air is good. Okay, this bit here is talking about uh, another robot he's got, which is on the next video, which is uh, more of an office assistant type thing. Very crude early prototype, but it shows some of the things that can be done. That's just a little picture of the software that it uses, and it's really made of modular components, many of which were developed for other things that do various generic things like root planning, <coughs> three dimensional vision, etc. So the lady here is saying, Robot, please fetch my. Please fetch the stapler from my office. Off it goes, opens the doors, and here's the gate. You open doors that you know of type that hasn't even seen before.
Yeah, so it's finding the coffee mug in a pretty messy uh, lab environment. Using the three-dimensional range, range finders plus the video cameras. Did I say coffee mug or mistake one? And now it's going to try and pick up the coffee mug without crushing it. Oh, the staple without crushing it. I noticed that when it returns the stapler, it doesn't actually thank the robot. So she hasn't sort of anthropomorphised it at all. Uh, it just gives it to her and that's it. it takes its head off. Okay. Alright, no, it takes the stapler. Okay. So it's doing an incredible amount of things there. Navigating a somewhat unknown environment, opening doors with a type that may have not seen before. Dealing with three-dimensional vision, etc., etc., also language understanding as well. Okay, you may have seen this. So they're now looking. This is being developed for the Defence Forces with view. This has been uh, developed for the Defence Forces with a view to carrying stuff for infantry soldiers. So infantry soldiers are limited to about 30 to 40 kilos of stuff they can carry. So the idea is to have one of these things that can uh, tag along and carry stuff for it. Uh, over all sorts of terrain and so forth. So I believe we're getting fairly close to, to rolling these things out. The uh, physical endurance and capacity to carry heavy things is one of the uh, main constraints on what infantry soldiers can do. So you see it's walking up through a fairly messy forest. Now it's on ice and he gives it a good kick. And uh, there's an even more uh, sort of hairy one coming up. So I was sort of thinking 10 or 15 years ahead, would you want one of these with a gun on the front chasing you? So, yeah, this is pretty amazing. Um, nearly falls over, but it manages to... Just two guys hiding in there. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, no. That's the last time you come to one of my <laughs> Alright, so just uh, by the skin of its teeth. So, uh, this is the sort of thing that's coming. And as you can see, in real time, they're actually moving the things. So it's actually dealing with that, that issue. And getting things to walk on two feet has been a real challenge. Uh, again, our human brain is such an amazing thing uh, that we do all this stuff without, without <coughs> really without thinking. And it's a funny thing about artificial intelligence that a lot of the things that people thought would be really hard, like playing chess, have proven to be quite soluble. But things that a three-year-old can do, like tell a, tell a dog from a cat, which is known in artificial intelligence as the dog-cat problem, uh, have proven to be very, very difficult. So walking is one of those sort of difficult things. This one is, this is actually an implementation of HTM, which I talked about before. And one of the frustrations of bird watching is that you stand there and you see nothing. 
<laughs> and you'd get cold or hot or whatever. <clears throat> so the idea is to set up a video camera and, get, and, tell, and uh, use an HDM to train the video to recognise birds. And so it will only take video of the moments when birds appear. And so this is the video you end up with. Now in this case you could do this with a simple motion detector, but uh, they've actually trained it. So if a rat ran across, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't take a video of the rat. Um, and so that way you can get much better uh, use out of your bird watching time. There was another another video on YouTube of a guy who actually used this because he, he had uh, squirrels getting into his bird cage and eating the bird's food. So he uh, set up a, a water pistol to fire at the squirrels and uh, solved his squirrel problem that way. I think there's another another type of bird comes along shortly on that list. <coughs> Okay, now in this one, it's actually uh, doing a similar thing, watching your post office box and just looking for interesting things to happen. And you'll see it's, it surrounds the people with a yellow square. And see the yellow square around the person in quite a different context. So this, this people's product is basically around scanning things uh, taking like hours and hours of video and just filtering out the interesting things, such as when people appear in a car park or whatever. So in this case they're telling me, well look, I'm interested in people, but only people who are coming in and out of the door. So that's what they're doing there. You set the area of interest and then you can sort of filter the, you know, actually this is a simple bit, the hard bit is actually recognising people. And obviously you can send yourself emails or texts or whatever based on, on that happening. I think somewhere in here there's a... Yeah, so this is the street scene. Okay, so I don't know if you've heard of the Jeopardy Challenge. Um, this is a quiz show in the US, a bit like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, something like that. And I've even been, uh, entered a computer against two previous champions. And the computer basically completely defeated them. You can see, let's see if I can stop it. You can see that Watson had $6,000 and the others had $400 and zero. So this is a thing where it asks a question in text and often there are puns and jokes and all sorts of funny things. And Watson won the challenge. So this is a very difficult challenge because it, it involves general knowledge, understanding of jokes, understanding of the, uh, the language, all sorts of things. And so this was kind of a bit of a, to me, a bit of a, uh, a moment that said, you know, computers are starting to get to the point where uh, they will eventually surpass surpass humans. So that was Watson and the Jeopardy challenge.
right now. There's obviously a lot, lot more material around, but uh, that's uh, that's the uh, uh, end of my formal presentation. So uh, I'll just uh, open the floor to any questions. Okay, uh, can we get someone to look after the microphone? Okay, any questions? So, what can you derive from um, what you've shown us uh, as to where artificial intelligence seems to be heading in the future? Okay, good question. I do have a slide on that, which is my putting my sort of neck on the block here. Just my predictions of what's likely to happen and when. So, as I said, 2030, 2040, somewhere around that starts. Time we'll have full human level artificial artificial intelligence, uh, and going through to that time, we'll see things like self-driving cars. And if you have a job that involves driving taxis, driving trucks, driving trains, or anything like that, it's very likely computers will, will replace your job uh, within probably 10 to 15 years. And what I see happening is a kind of rising watermark of more and more jobs will be doable by computers, and less and less will be left to people. And so that is our big challenge, and that's why I put the thing at the bottom there, which says, are we going to be a legend aristocracy, which would be the good outcome, or are we going to be basically an unemployed underclass when this, uh, when this happens? So uh, it'll be happening progressively over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. OK. Um, is it on? What would happen if somebody hacked into the system? Yeah, that's a, good, that's, that's a good question. And uh, this happens with, of course, with humans. Uh, you know, I've had fr friends who've been uh, hacked into, in a sense, and joined cults and all sorts of things. You know, people become criminals. So, if, if fundamentally, those things are not new. What? Uh, the, the whole, there's, a, there's a, sort of a whole plethora of issues around this. Uh, you know, once you've got a super intelligent computer, who can, who controls it? Who gives it its orders? Who can control? It? You know, were, were the Romanovs able to control Rasputin? You know, was was uh, uh, so. What you need to have is, uh, and uh, the Singularity Institute trying to push this to have some sort of research program uh, put in place to deal with these issues of how do we make artificial intelligence friendly to people. And how do we make it robust and, and not uh, and make it impossible or as difficult as possible for people to take that artificial intelligence and use it for, for bad purposes? I mean, one example uh, could be, for example, if the rich and famous and powerful can afford these computers before anyone else, you'll have big companies, you'll have politicians exploiting this hyper-intelligence for their own purposes, you know, to manipulate people, to manipulate events, financial markets, all sorts of things. So there's a, there's a huge amount of challenges there, uh, which uh, include hacking, uh, but it goes also well beyond it. Um, just want to say something about the, the trains part there. The, I just worked with a the company, they already trains completely automated. There's no oh, yeah. like robot, so there's no need to have a physical robot there. Um, the airplanes are moving very close. They, Again, happen to work in a company uh, for a company that actually do that. Eventually, uh, probably between 15, yeah, probably 15 years, we'll, yeah, as I said, we'll have for all the airplanes, like the big, com big uh, commercial airplanes, completely automated. Yeah. Um, that just wanted to mention that. Uh, regarding actually to the uh, earlier question, um, I asked the question uh, yesterday as well. All these uh, very complex technologies uh, pose uh, risks. I'm talking about not not sophisticated, not and not about uh, um, security type, is where people intentionally manipulate this technology uh, and do harm to other people. I'm talking about just um, just um, simple safety risks that that can happen because of of, of failures or some unwanted uh, um, interactions. How, how do you think that we're going to deal with that? Because I can tell you from my experience with even the simpler system of today, this is a huge challenge. 
the game so complex. And uh, I can see when you're going to have all these robots all over the place and they're going to, by mistake, uh, you know, kill over people left and right, who's going to be at fault? Because now, when, you, when a person does it, yeah, you, you, you prosecute them and they get punished, but when, when robots are going to do that, what are you going to do? Who's going to be to blame? Okay, a good question. So, how do, who do you hold accountable when the robots do the wrong thing? And particularly if the robot's kind of learning for itself, uh, you know, lots of different people are involved in building it and different trade-offs are made. And it's, you do have to certainly sense similar issues with uh, industrial accidents at the moment. You know, if there's a release of pollutants, whose fault was it? Was it the engineer who, you know, just worked three shifts straight and made an error of judgement? Or was it management who, uh, you know, who set up that kind of structure? Or, or what? What was it? So it's um, it's just very difficult to uh, come up with any clear and simple answers. One thing I would say though is that typically automated systems are a lot safer uh, than humans. I mean, we, uh, Sebastian Thrun claims that, for example, that robotic cars would be something like ten times safer than the cars run by human beings. Yeah, uh, you, have to, you have to prove that, and, and before you actually release them. Yes. That's that's right. So so we need to do pilots, prototypes. I mean, there is. I think uh, James uh, made an interesting comment at one stage that. Uh, automated self-driving mining equipment has been feasible for a while, but it hasn't happened because insurance is a problem. So there's a lot of actually institutional inertia that is pushing these things back. So um, that's as much of an issue as as the other issue, which is overconfidence and so on. And there's you know there's been so many technological disasters where people use new technology, whether it's lead in car, petrol, whether it's uh, asbestos. X-rays, all sorts of things have been overused and misused uh, with, with this sort of blithe overconfidence that it will be fine, or insecticides, whatever. So, so we need to go in with our eyes open. But uh, I, I think um, one, of the, one of the other factors is that people seem to have a kind of zero tolerance uh, approach to machine errors. They expect machines never to make mistakes. <coughs> Whereas if you ring up, say, a call centre and the person makes a few mistakes that you, the person that you talk to makes a few mistakes, you kind of accept that that's human. But if you, if you punch in certain numbers and the machine record, you know, plays back a different set of numbers, you, it, it's not what you expect. You expect kind of perfection. So we kind of do have a higher standard for machines. But, but the issue of quality control, and particularly with complex software, is really uh, not a solved problem. But the, the other, the issue though is the efficient. Overall, it will be a lot safer. Overall, it will be a lot more efficient. So, we need to somehow do the best we can to deal with those issues. Um, looking probably a little bit beyond the timeline you're laying out there, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh -huh. um, when artificial intelligences become more intelligent than humans and they start to be a better place to make decisions and all that sort of thing. How do we ensure that what they want is what we want? Oh, you've you put your, your finger on a very difficult question. Um, I, I, all I can suggest is that you have a look at the Singularity, the Singularity Institute and Eliza Yudkovsky. Go to the Singularity Institute site so and you so he's done a lot of work on this question of how do we build friendly AIs that will act in our interests. And part of the problem is, uh, this is why they call it a singularity, because when we get to that point that they're smarter than us, we can't tell what they're going to do. We, it's kind of invisible to us, it's unpredictable, any more than, say, apes or the ape-like creatures we evolved from could have predicted technological civilization. It's just beyond uh, what, we can, what we can conceive. So, in that sense, it's, uh, it's an insoluble problem. Um, my personal view is, 
I, I'm just hoping we'll sort of morph into these super intelligent machines, merge with them and go for the ride. Um, and, uh, but the, the other issue is, whether, the question is whether the robots will act in our interests or the AIs will act in our interests. But what is our interest? I mean, humanity has all sorts of different competing and conflicting interests. It's very difficult to say what is the interest of humans. You know, is the interest of humans to have more people or less people? Or, you know, what about distribution of wealth? What if the AIs decide the current distribution of wealth is unfair and nine-tenths of our wealth has to go to the third world? They could well do that, and you could perhaps morally justify it, but that, that may not be what I want. <coughs> so, uh, as, uh, Elijah is a very smart guy, and he has not solved the problem, and I don't think anyone has, and possibly no one can. So, that's something we need to think about before we go to that point of superhuman intelligence is what are we doing here? Okay, I've got a question. Um, well, now, okay, so it seems like we're creating AIs as tools for us to utilise. Um, and we need to be careful when we're creating a tool that's actually self-aware. If it, we're going to give it self-awareness, if we're going to give it a sense of want, then should we really be trying to bias it towards what we want or try and constrain it towards what we want? It's kind of like trying to enslave an incredibly intelligent um, organism. It's, it sounds very dangerous also that if, if we try and enslave an intelligence to, um, to do our bidding, to follow what we want. Um, I think it's also worth considering maybe it should decide what's ethical. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. You know, so Based example, on what it thinks is ethical, not on what we think is ethical. Yeah, yeah and would we want... The, just, sort of, just something to consider. Would we want apes from three million years ago to have determined what our moral code should be now? Exactly. It's a similar kind of thing. You know, do we want chimpanzee meant uh, morality imposed on us? Do we want to impose our morality? You know, as Nietzsche said, morality is something to overcome to go to the next morality. So, interesting question. Hi, at the risk of always representing non-human biomass, I can foresee, for example, robotic cars, uh, robot-driven cars and trucks colliding with a kangaroo. Now, is that automatically driven truck capable of assessing whether that grew or to be bashed over the head and put out of its misery, collected and taken to wires. Would veterinary medicine, which is a very complex medicine I can compare with human medicine, able to diagnose what's wrong with a variety of creatures? I can pick up a black snake and take it to my local vet or a bird, Indian bird, and assess whether that animal is probably on the, on the run, capable of being saved, capable of not being saved. I want to say that we are part of an entire spectrum of organisms. And when we make these decisions on, the on behalf of ourselves, we should also be husbanding and taking care of how these robots might treat the less sentient creatures that we, we share this earth with. I'm very distressed by the fact that we just confine things to people and robots and not to the effect that robots might have on the greater um, variety of life on this, on this earth. No, good point. Uh, yeah. we, I mean, we have a very bad track record of how we treat less creatures and you know, the way we've treated our relatives, the apes, uh, it sort of is a bit um, salutary in terms of hopefully the robots will be nicer to us than we were. <laughs> to our forebears or our relatives. And so, yeah, good point. Well, um, we've got time maybe for one more, but yeah, so it's going to be a quick one. Quick? Uh, what you, what's the future of the motion? Uh, that's, actually, that's a very good, good question. Um, what, I sort of slightly alluded to this in your talk in, in relation to reinforcement learning. And what AI researchers are increasingly finding is that if you just build a computational machine, you can, it can't really make decisions because it doesn't know what's important. It doesn't know what it wants. And you almost seem to have to put some kind of emotion and function into the AIs to make them work. You know, it tells you what to pay attention to, what your goals are, what your objectives are, etc. So, so in that sense, I think the AIs will have to have some kind of 
uh, analogue to our human emotions. Um, in terms of the way the human brain is structured, we kind of started off whereby um, our emotions were the way we kind of processed information, fear, anger, you know, lust, whatever, and then we put the cognitive brain on top of that. So emotions are not just, just in quotes, how, you know, whether we feel good or bad, but they're actually how we reason, part of how we reason about the world and how we process the world. So I think emotions are very important and something like that will be there in this uh, artificial general intelligences going forward, but exactly what it looks like, I'm not sure. Excellent. Put your hands together.